Mirror's Edge is a strange game in so many ways. It was released during an international economic crisis and was overshadowed by other gigantic game releases, but it managed to cultivate a large enough following to warrant a sequel. It also is largely responsible for the popularization of parkour mechanics throughout the game's industry. Despite the unlucky circumstances surrounding the game's release window, Mirror's Edge is often referred to as a timeless masterpiece, a first-person jump-and-run parkour game which is often commended for sporting exceptional graphical fidelity, innovative gameplay and impeccable animations. Game audio tends to fly under the radar, and especially when it comes to Mirror's Edge, I do not understand why. The game not only features great music, but also impressive dynamic audio systems and ambient sound design, which goes above and beyond what an average player might expect from a linear action game from the late 2000s. I hope I can showcase how special Mirror's Edge truly is in this episode of Sound Design and Games. Mirror's Edge takes place in a rather believable world which is quite similar to our own, yet much cleaner and dominated by Bauhaus and brutalist architecture. The game doesn't lend itself to crazy science fiction soundscapes, sounds of mythical dragons or crazy high-tech weaponry. It rather has to rely on familiar sounds we all know too well. Footsteps, rustling of clothing, hands grabbing onto things, shattering glass, the sound of running past structures and people, and to top all this off, we have mundane city life soundscapes which you could only register as background noise going about your day-to-day -day life. Listen up, I want to show you something. Welcome to City 17. We're here for a reason, mainly to showcase one rather boring aspect of sound design, which you would never think about twice. Let's get off this train. Welcome. Welcome to City 17. You have chosen or been chosen to relocate to the Did you hear that? Remaining urban centers. No, n not 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 the robot thing. The footsteps. Nothing to write home about. As is the case for most video games. You have a collection of alternative footstep sound effects which are triggered in a random pattern. Half-Life 2 of course features different footstep samples for different surfaces as well. The footsteps are there and they work, but they aren't quite as realistic and they do not take into account how Gordon's feet interact with the ground. And besides, Half-Life 2 relies more on its environmental soundscapes rather than a dynamic soundtrack and detailed sound effects of a player character's body, which you cannot even see if you look down. Besides the footsteps, we cannot actually hear Gordon Freeman. No friction between his legs, no rustling of clothing, no clinking of his HEV suit. Gordon doesn't even seem to get exhausted over time, judging by the lack of breathing. I've had enough of this future dystopia. Let's go back in time again. Here we are again, in the city. Let's take a walk. You might notice that the footsteps sound a lot more convincing, and instead of only hearing footsteps, you also can make out the friction and rustling of Faith's clothing. This was necessary as for one, Faith was fully modeled, and more importantly, all you do in Mirror's Edge is jump, run and climb. So an incredible amount of attention was put into making Faith sound real. Let us look and listen at the footsteps again. This time though, with as little ambient noise as possible. Welcome to movement.umap, a demonstration map I created in a day in order to showcase the movement sounds. It is not very pretty at all, but functional for this demonstration. Don't pay attention to that. Don't look at that. Okay. The interesting thing is that footsteps are actually composed of multiple sound effects. The movement sounds are played at specific keyframes of the animations and consist of a foot plant, foot lift, 
and a cloth sound which originates from Faith's baggy pants, at a key frame when both legs touch each other in the movement side. This ensures that footsteps always sound accurate if a player decides to modulate the running speed. The movement also possesses an escalation system, which dictates what samples are chosen for varying movement speeds. Different sounds for sneaking, walking and running exist to make movement feel even more natural. And there even are appropriate sounds for Faith readjusting her body while turning around in place. For a game with an almost single-minded emphasis on movement, going above and beyond with an area of a sound design like the footsteps, something an average gamer might not even take note of during their playthrough, actually greatly enhances the experience. In a game like Half-Life 2, the focus is on the shooting and the puzzles. You most likely would not notice some repetition and simplistic design of the footstep sounds. For Mirror's Edge though, this kind of thing would have stuck out like a sore thumb. So I would say that the time the sound team put into this absolutely paid off. Wall runs also got their own footstep and foot release sounds. This is not the only part of the puzzle for making the movement sound great though. We also have interactions which involve hands touching different props, like pipes, ladders and various different surfaces hands have to touch in order for Faith to climb on top of them or vault over them. Everything you could think of in terms of movement is accounted for, and that is great. We also hear more interesting details in other movement options. Vaulting, for instance, is accompanied by whooshing sounds, which I could only distinctively hear in my test map. When swinging from pipe to pipe, you can hear a distinct ring when swinging off the previous pipe. Finally, another addition to Mirror's Edge was the escalation-based breathing system. It is also based on the player character's velocity. When idling, the player hears long inhales and exhales through the nose. When gaining speed, the breaths become shorter. And when reaching a certain threshold, Faith starts to in and exhale in long breaths through her mouth, which become shorter over time. When she comes to a standstill, the breathing de-escalates relatively quickly back to the long breaths through the nose. All of these sound effects working together greatly amplify the experience of playing as Faith. It is great that thanks to the sound team's efforts with the sound design, Faith can truly feel like a living, breathing person, a character audiences can get immersed to play as, something that is often lacking in other first-person games. For movement, animations and sound effects have to work together. The same rings true for combat. When fighting against a cop, we have different sounds for punching an NPC's head or torso. So when Faith punches the NPC, the game plays the punching animation, and when it reaches the specific keyframe that plays a sound, 
It checks whether or not Faith is hitting the head or torso or misses the punch altogether and then plays the appropriate sound file for the attack. Speaking of combat, guns are pretty much carried by sound design entirely. Aside from the punchy and loud gun sounds, visually not much is actually happening. Guns might sound similar to guns from another game, which sports way more shooting and no parkour at all. The similarity isn't coincidental. Ben Minto, one of the guys who worked on Black's guns, also happens to be the same person who handled Foley recordings and creating the gun sounds for Mirror's Edge. No custom gun recordings were done for Mirror's Edge, Instead, they were designed by combining previous session material and library source. Some of the gun sounds were initially intended for Black 2, an unannounced and unreleased sequel, before finding their way into Mirror's Edge. One giveaway for the gunshots not being real becomes apparent when taking a listen at the shotgun sounds. This very certainly isn't what a shotgun sounds like. But it is incredibly satisfying to use this gun for the sound design alone. The assault rifles and machine guns especially are incredibly loud and maybe even a bit distorted when fired. These weapon sounds are a key contributor to the tension of the game's chase sequences, as enemies will be frequently shooting at Faith while in pursuit from behind her. The booming firing sounds create a clear sense of immediate danger for the player. Realism is what many players expect from realistic looking guns nowadays. But it can be a bit boring. Gun recordings are a great option for games that revolve around shooting. Simulators like Hot Dogs, Horseshoes and Hand Grenades, or Arma, require realistic sounding guns. But there is nothing inherently wrong with Hollywood-esque sounds for firearms either. For Mirror's Edge, I prefer Hollywood. Before we delve into Foley, there is another important thing to touch on, which also hinges a bit on movement. One design principle of Mirror's Edge was that any noise you hear in the game has a source. Air conditioning units make noise, and some of them are broken and emit their own characteristic rattling sounds. Pipes have water running through them. The traffic can be heard throughout the city, and certain locations also feature special soundscapes, like the storm drain section of the jackknife chapter, which features many sounds of flowing and dripping water. Ambience also has something to do with movement. First off, when Faith starts gaining speed, wind is added on top of all the other systems that relate to movement. Even the sound of different objects change depending on proximity and velocity of the player. The sound of an AC is perceived differently when standing right next to it idling when compared to running past it at full speed. When far away from an object, its sound blends into the noise of the city. The game modulates the sound based on proximity, and of course at some point cuts the sound off and disables it completely when the player is too far away to hear it. One drawback of the velocity-based sounds is if Faith herself isn't accelerating, no sounds can be emitted from the objects. This posed a distinct challenge for the sound designers in the train segment in which Faith jumps onto a roof of a moving train and dodges obstacles coming her way. While the player perceives Faith as standing on top of a moving vehicle, in reality the train is stationary and Faith is standing on a non-moving object. 
The tunnel itself is built out of different components which spawn and despawn periodically in order to create the illusion of a train driving through a tunnel. Since Faith is not actually being accelerated, the world around her is, a distinct system had to be implemented into that portion of the level, where objects around Faith emit whooshing sounds when passing the player. Another big aspect that cannot be ignored is sound occlusion. Occlusion means that sounds are blocked or muffled by other surfaces. Mirror's Edge possesses a lot of faked occlusion, traffic being a good example. By walking away from the ledge, the sound of traffic is occluded more and more, making it less prevalent the further you distance yourself from the ledge. Notice how car horns are still audible away from the ledge, but the sound of asphalt is non-existent? <sighs> or when walking indoors, the sound from outside gets muffled. The occlusion isn't real though, and that is apparent with how intense the shift in audio is when walking out of one area and into the next. Take a listen. The ambience reacts to the player, and it contributes to a design philosophy called the runner's bubble. This design concept explains what a runner should be able to hear in their immediate surroundings when navigating the environment at any speed. This concept includes ambient noises, music, and also specific events that happen around the runner at all times. What sounds should be amplified and which ones shouldn't overpower others? The experience of standing still in a corridor may not be as exciting as running past it, but both experiences feel natural, as there are a lot of audio sources going off at the same time. Other decisions have been made which stray away from realism and take over a functional role. To enhance the player's awareness of runner enemies chasing after them, the footsteps of the PK runners have been amplified to be heard clearly. This invokes stress in the player and lets them know how close the PKs are and from what direction they are approaching Faith from. This greatly helps in ramping up the pressure when compared to Faith's previous encounters with enemies, as by the time the runners are introduced, the player will be well accustomed to slow moving cops or SWAT teams that can never keep up with them as long as they don't take a wrong turn. Suddenly coming into contact with hostiles that are able to keep up the chase consistently with their footsteps always a short distance away can send the player's blood pressure through the roof. From these examples we can see that achieving realism isn't always the goal for a game sound design. And doesn't need to be. As the name implies, sound is designed. Which means that the experience can be crafted to invoke emotion and provide function while being believable. Many times the sounds we hear aren't actually produced with the exact same materials we would expect, which is what Foley most of the times is about. What looks like an incredibly messy garage filled with a lot of junk and recording equipment actually is an ideal environment for Foley recording sessions. In order for the sound designers to be able to conduct their art, the studio is jam-packed with props that reproduce interesting sounds. Grates, pipes and fences, instruments, cables, furniture, and in the case of this particular studio in which the Mirror's Edge Foley sessions took place, SVT in Stockholm, even a car is present in the middle of the studio. Any surface you would need to record for an urban parkour game is present, from glass to dirt, 
concrete, grass and gravel. Sometimes objects are even stacked on top of each other to create more nuanced sounds, or to dampen sounds which may otherwise include an unwanted texture. For instance, the reverb of a sheet of metal being eliminated through dampening achieved by a blanket laid underneath. A lot of the recording process of Mirror's Edge included designers scraping their shoes across different surfaces, hands handling objects in different ways, and a lot of stepping and jumping. For most surfaces in the game, the designers had to create footstep and handstep sounds, together with soft, medium and hard landings. The recording process was quite strenuous for the footsteps, as not only one but several footstep and lift-off sounds have to be recorded in order for them to sound natural in-game when played in a random pattern. For gory, bone-crunching sounds, a sound designer would often use frozen vegetables, often in combination with more slimy or jelly-like substances, for the fleshier sounds needed. In terms of hardware and software, a lot of processing happened with most sound files using various filters and software. For microphones, both a TLM-103 and a DPA-4011 were used. Discussion and experimentation also happened all the time, specifically regarding how certain sounds should be recorded. Should the microphone be positioned at foot level, or should the microphone be positioned at ear height? Recording at foot level may reproduce cleaner audio, but what if those sounds sound weird as the footsteps would appear at ear's height? Should the microphone be positioned off axis or not? If we point the microphone right down at our feet at head level, we might simulate the sound of footsteps while tilting the head down at our feet, but footsteps might sound off when looking ahead while running. Another issue was that you couldn't just run and hold a field recorder to record the footsteps. Holding a microphone introduces sounds originating from handling and operating the recorder. While this can add a lot to your run cycle in battlefield-like experiences, for Mirror's Edge every step had to be recorded cleanly. So the designers marked a spot on the ground and repeatedly stepped on it to get consistent and clean audio to use in the game. In the end, a lot of the recording process also consists of feeling things out. If it sounds right, it's right. And that is one of the more magical aspects of Foley recording. Making something sound as it should sound doesn't always have to be achieved by recording that specific thing. This is best showcased with an audio example. What you might perceive as the sound of rain actually is frying bacon. If we see a visual cue and hear a sound that is accurate enough, our mind fills in the rest. So in the end, the sound doesn't necessarily have to be spot on perfect. Some designers may cheat all the time and get away with it. Because if done right, you won't spot the difference anyway. Thank you for supporting Sound Design and Games. This is an independent production, so any help would be appreciated. Share a video around, give it a like, subscribe on my Patreon or Gumroad, anything helps. Well, we got pretty much every subject covered so far, we need to take a look at one of the most memorable aspects of Mirror's Edge's sound design, which would be the music. Mirror's Edge would not have been the same without the stunning compositions of Magnus Bigerson, or as we best know him as, Solar Fields. Mirror's Edge almost feels like a game that was made and can only work with the Solar Fields sound. And as it turns out, this is no coincidence. For the Mirror's Edge project, I was really lucky because they wanted to have the solar field sound. Oh. Yeah, they wanted solar fields for the music. So that was quite easy for me, you know. But of course, you have limitations to work around. Everything needs to work. And uh, But uh, yeah, basically it was like when I was producing music for my normal albums or whatever, you know. But uh, slightly different, of course. But After chatting with Magnus, 
he offered to connect me to the audio director of a project, who funnily enough, also named Magnus. In my conversation with Magnus Walterstadt, I found out many interesting bits of information revolving around the sound design of a project, which was discussed in this production earlier. But I also heard the story of how Solar Fields was brought onto the project. Walterstadt grew up listening to many kinds of music, but he was especially infatuated with synthetic ambient music. When he was working on a concept video for the project, he was listening to Pandora, a music streaming service of the time. Pandora could recommend music based on what musicians and music genres the user liked. The algorithm then recommended a music project called Hoover Network and a track titled Cocoon Moon, which was a piece by Solar Fields. Walterstadt researched Hoover Network and found that the project was composed of a French musician and a Swedish artist, who coincidentally even shared his first name. Walterstadt thought that this kind of music would be perfect for Mirror's Edge, and the thought of working with a Swedish musician excited him. So he began phoning every person named Magnus Biggershon he could find. After only two or three phone calls, he finally found Solar Fields. Walterstadt offered to bring Solar Fields onto the project, and soon after Walterstadt sent concept material to see what Biggershon could come up with. The music he got back was almost spot on, and he described that for a majority of the project, very little direction was needed for the music. To quote Walterstadt in regards to his work with Biggershon, he said this, When you don't have to direct someone, that's when you know instantly the result is gonna be awesome. So Solar Fields just conducted his work as he would for an album. The music was recorded off hardware synthesizers and it was composed in stems. Stems are different components of any given music track. For instance, percussion, noise and bass could be three separate stems which could be mixed however the musician wanted them to. Biggershon only had to keep a few guidelines in mind. For instance, reverb shouldn't be present in the stems if the level isn't taking place in a large open space, like the cavernous storm drains. Interestingly enough, Biggershon didn't even play the game while composing the music for it. I had the, like uh, screen captures and sometimes of course I was up in Stockholm in the studio and uh, I had meeting with the level designers and uh, then I could play through the game but I, when I was working in the studio I had no access to the to the to the build or whatever no I mean I I had playthrough videos so I I could actually see and 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 look on how each level were working but, but everything was the whole game Nothing was finished when I was started to work with it, you know, so it was a com constant development. And okay. that's why I also had meetings with the level designers and uh, everything. So I had their input also, what they were hearing in the level and that kind of stuff. What helped the designers in implementing Solar Fields music was pre-planning and stingers. The designers had an idea of how long each segment would take for the player to complete and where exactly a music track would change to another. But since music isn't mixed dynamically in Mirror's Edge, the sound team had to settle for stereo music tracks, which play when triggering events in the level. Here, for instance, the music resumes when Faith barges through that door. Or here, we change from chase music to a calmer theme. Many times tracks do not transition well into each other when crossfaded. So the sound designers employed stingers and reverse stingers to hide dissonant transitions. Stingers could also be used to end a music track perfectly at the end of a level. The music wasn't always implemented in this way. While the music we got in the final product is absolutely excellent when experienced both in and outside of a game, it wasn't truly really dynamic. Remember the stems we talked about before? 
Initially, the game mixed stems dynamically with a beat-based system, depending on what was happening in the game. This was another aspect of a runner's bubble. Dynamic music which responds to the player's actions. So depending on if Faith idles, accelerates, fights or runs at full speed, the soundtrack would be different. This again is best showcased in an audiovisual example. <laughs> This is a video composite. All music you hear was edited in a video editor to demonstrate how music could have sounded like if a dynamic mixing was implemented into the game. don't resent me for uncovering the secret. You might feel a bit disappointed knowing that this awesome dynamic music system was omitted from the final game. To our and the designer's disappointment, technology at the time made it impossible to implement a dynamic stem based music system into the game. To explore why, we need to get into some boring territories. This is a PlayStation 3. It is my absolute favorite console of all time. But it was flawed. Not so much for most consumers, but most importantly for developers who tried to create new innovative systems for games. Mirror's Edge was a multi-platform title, so it needed to be optimized for the lowest common denominator for hardware, which at the time was the PlayStation 3. While GPUs and CPUs were important to consider, what killed Mirror's Edge's dynamic stem mixing feature was the limited random access memory at the time which is why I will solely focus on that in this chapter. Let us compare some numbers. PCs from 2005 to 2009 generally possessed up to 4GB of RAM. Not much by today's standards, but 4GB are enough to run any game of the time and would have easily allowed the stem mixing feature to function while also having enough memory available to load in all other necessary assets at runtime. The Xbox 360 only features an eighth of a PC's RAM, 512 megabytes. From a PC gamer's perspective, half a gigabyte is very little. But a console has less going on in general when compared to a computer. 
Remember, a computer is used for games, but also productivity and utility software, which may run in the background while a game is running. It is little, but it isn't too complicated to handle the RAM budget on that console. The PlayStation 3 features only 248 megabytes of RAM, half of the Xbox 360's RAM and the 16th of a typical PC's RAM at the time. Everything from textures, 3D models, sound effects and also the music had to get crammed into 248 megabytes at any given time. This of course meant that assets needed to be streamed, loaded and unloaded constantly. Audio takes up little space in RAM. The vast majority of space is boggled up by visual assets. Every bud was worth gold. So what often happened during development was that the sound designers would sneakily implement longer audio files to reserve space in order to ensure that enough RAM would be free for anything they planned to do in the future of the project. That space of course was also given up when more bytes were needed to get something else to work. For a console that already doesn't have much RAM to spare, Implementing a soundtrack that requires up to 6 files or potentially more to be loaded at all times was too much to ask at the time. Sadly the stems had to go. But luckily, the great music stayed. Mirror's Edge never was a game that was meant to be. It wasn't a game that was written down in a notebook, somewhere to be found in one of the designer's drawers. And many of the decisions made for the game arose from circumstance. For instance, the game got its iconic look one day when the developers needed to load up the game without textures to debug a problem, only to find out that the game looked beautiful without them. The concept of the game was synthesized out of many tried game concepts, which for one reason or another were redone or scrapped entirely. It could maybe be considered a happy accident. The game wasn't destined to feature Solar Field's music from the beginning of the project. Birgashon just happened to have a dedicated fan on Pandora, who just happened to be an audio director working on DICE. And that guy, like Birgashon, was called Magnus too. Something that was no coincidence, however, was that the people behind Mirror's Edge were highly skilled, motivated, and harbored a mutual understanding on what their project was supposed to be about. That understanding spawned a game that had an art style like no other. A playstyle that was alien to the gaming scene at the time, one of the most interesting and instantly recognizable protagonists ever designed, and of course, a soundtrack that is just as striking as the many locales the player may find themselves in. Hopefully this production cleared up some questions you may have had about Mirror's Edge, or maybe you were able to come to appreciate the work of the many sound designers that made Mirror's Edge sound great. Thank you for watching Sound Designing Games.